how much of it is attitude, Ovi? Like, do do you do you go into graffiti with an attitude of I'm going to make enemies because I'm just going to go in hard? When I when I started, you know, getting up, you went at it. Were like, yes, I'm that dude. I'm that person. I'm that. Yeah. I'm the king. I'm going to go and terrorize. And if anybody wants beef, it's whatever. Killer, killer, bo- 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 podcast. KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller podcast. <laughs> let's let's do it. Let me tell you, I hardly don't do interviews, man. And I say, you know what? Let me let me give it a chance. Let me give it a shot. You know, my brother, you're in safe, safe hands. Trust me, trust me. It's okay. a good podcast. People are gonna love it. No doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Killer Keller podcast reporting to you live and direct central London or essential as you need to be. International status right now. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. And if you haven't checked out the Keller Vision app or free download Android and iPhone, then you're severely missing out in your life, man. People like us do things like this. And without further ado, we're going over to the East Coast to a man that, from, from my point of view, I got into his stuff early. He's a renegade. He's a trailblazer, East Coast represent, Bronx represent, TNG, J4F, OV inside the place. A.K.A. the truth. <laughs> A.K.A. the truth. And that's something <laughs> actually that plays really hard on your pieces, man. You really get into it. I mean, you're, you're prolific at this, right? Absolutely, man. I mean, when I did graffiti, man, it was, you know, it was a rebellious movement. And I did it more because I needed an identity for myself. And that was my therapy. That was my session to go to counseling, you know, and that's why I did what I did, you know, as I learned the history and as I made sure becoming a part of the culture. OV man, can I say your name? I Listen, it, it, there's very few people that I could talk to on here and I'm just like, yo, this is mad serendipity. I remember seeing you on GTV, import only video. I felt like I was the only person in London that had it at a time. I'm sure there's others, but you know, these are like blueprints um, of, of American graph, East Coast particularly, that really, really captured my imagination at a young age. And yo, like you were, to me, I was just like, yo, that's the guy. He he, getting up hard. He, he you were doing it on video with zero fucks given. And it's just like it's amazing that you're here, man. I, I just got to hand it to you off the bat, brother. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it, man. And you know, and and like I said, and that in that part of time, we're talking about you know early to mid nineties. It was very rough, but you know, it was a rebellious movement that I took with me and kept going with it. I mean, a lot a lot of the things was you had a lot of um. Well, how can I say you had a lot of options, whether to go forward it or whether to back up and quit, because it was just a lot of things you had against you. You had other crews, you know, that were very competitive, you know, in a street physical way. So you had to try to, you know, bypass that, you know, you had authorities, you know, that were constantly after you. You know, mm-hmm. and it, and it was just a lot of uh, a, a a lot of situations that you had to go through, and what people don't understand back then is that we didn't have social media, so uh-huh. basically it was so many writers, especially in the Bronx. Like the Bronx was one of the most fear, fierce for its boroughs. Like a lot of other boroughs, like you had Queens, Manhattan, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. A lot of those riders, very few came into the Bronx because it was, you know, a wreck, a wreck to be messed with. And a lot of riders didn't want to come into the Bronx if you wasn't from the Bronx. So on top of that, you had to deal with that, right? Then mm-hmm. there was so many riders, it was crowded. Like you couldn't just go and hit an empty space because everything was bombed, bombed. So you had you had to go over people. And then what happened was when you went over someone, 
Then guess what? Then you had beef with their friends. And then that and then that became a back and forth, wasting pain to claim a spot. And, you know, that that's what it was back then to get up. Like there was no room. You had to go over people. And hopefully that you had to keep coming back and claiming your spot. Because if 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 they didn't wipe you out, or the other crews were gonna wipe you out. And and it was a constant battle, constant battle. Oh, and that's how um, it was. It wasn't that's... like now with the social media. You take a picture with it, and then everyone sees it. And this is the thing with with your generation of writer. It, you know, it, it was almost like he, you've got the old school guys. You know, the old school guys up to about cope. Then from there on in, there's no social media. It's almost like a dip in um, exposure outside of the boroughs that you're representing. Um, and that's why I feel like it was really important to get you on. Um, more so getting an understanding of the area in the 90s, getting an understanding of what, you know, because people talk about how, you know, uh, destructive and how 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 much um how brutal the bronx was and very and, and and very territorial very territorial but really okay very territorial explain to me explain to me the, 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 what what the bronx was like in in the 90s well back then um there was a lot of abandoned buildings you had a uh, you know the streets were running very well with crack crack was a big addiction you know, and then the heroin came in. So you had that going on. Um, mm -hmm. Certain neighborhoods, you had to be careful because you strictly got robbed or possibly hurt battle, possibly even killed. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me make an example where I grew up in Kingsbridge, where, where I grew up in Kingsbridge. And yeah. um, we had this crew called TNG called, you know, it, it, it stands for um, the new generation. And they also, nice. they also, um, they also called the 20 TNG 25 to life. The 25 to life was because the crew was so ruthless that they were willing to do 25 years in jail. So let me get back to TNG. So TNG wow. was a crew that came from Kingsbridge, you know, and that area specifically in Kingsbridge, if they didn't know you, there was a, uh, there was a street called Morris Avenue. It was between Morris all the way to the university. So you had, Morris, Jerome Avenue, you had Coughlin, Webb, and then Nunavers. No, you had, I'm sorry, you had Morris, Jerome, uh, Ka uh, Davison, uh -huh. University, Coughlin, Webb Avenue, and Sedgwick. So between Morris Avenue all the way to Sedgwick, uh -huh. if you wasn't from that area because they all had that area, Man, it, it was it, you, you, you was asking for trouble. And you were a, I, I, yeah, you was and a lot of things went down. A lot of things, a lot of stabbing, a lot of killings, a lot of, a lot of shooting because TNG, wow. TNG was the type of crew that, that they did their money, making their money, you know, in the drug mm -hmm. trade, robbing people. And late at night, they would go out and bomb. They would go out and spray paint. That was their fun after they handled their business. As a relative, as a relative to the guy, the gang culture where they would paint, but they they saw the graffiti as part. Yeah, the, yeah. Well, right, because it started right because the graffiti played the street role of it, but mm. then it's like back in those times, um, if you became a graffiti writer, three things happened: either once the graffiti kicked in, then later mm. on you were either turned into a hustler, meaning you know being a drug dealer. Or you yeah. turned into criminal activities, or you got a straight job. And once you was 18, 19 years old, you left graffiti alone and you went about your business trying to live, you know, the standard legit way. What's the average statistic on that though, brother? What's the what was the what did you <laughs> more often see? <laughs> I, I I saw I, I saw people coming into the graph game and then you know getting into criminal activities. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was one of a few that made it out that, you know, I just threw with the graffiti, mm -hmm. got a got a little into the hustle money at, you know, at late, you know, I would say late teens into my early 20s. And then, you know, when I saw a lot of my friends getting killed, a lot of my friends going to jail for a long time, it just wasn't for me. I just and how didn't, old were you I, at that time, though, bro? How old, how old were you? 
I would say it was between, I would say between, I would say 2019 up until 22, 23. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, I, yeah, when, when I found out the mother of my son was pregnant, you know, and I had a legit job that my father had got me. That's when I just started looking at life differently, you know, stood, stood yeah. with the graffiti. I didn't mind getting into trouble and going to jail for that because mm-hmm. I knew that the time wouldn't hold weight. But at that time, yeah. at that specific time, I had to leave the, the, the legal, you know, street active criminal activity alone because I didn't want to spend my, the majority of my life in jail. That's not a life. Well, we'll get back to the time holds weight thing. That's quite a spiritual move you just played down. Like, oh, that's interesting. But we'll get yeah, into man. that because you know you're a man of 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 a, of a legacy and a and and a life within many many lives within a life. Um, I was surprised to to find out how big the Bronx as a borough is. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's pretty big. It's pretty big. I mean. You got different sections, but it's pretty big. I mean, but Brooklyn and Queens is much bigger. Brooklyn is, is like, that a fact? Brooklyn yeah, is Bro- huge, yeah, yeah. Brooklyn and Queens, they they the two biggest boroughs. I would say Brooklyn, it's about maybe the size of the Bronx and then another quarter of the Bronx. So Brooklyn is pretty big. Brooklyn, Brooklyn is pretty big. As somebody from the the, the Bronx area. What were your ambitions to begin with? You know, being a young young person and having this desire to like get up um you'd obviously there had been the the um early introductions you know potentially like when you was growing up as a kid to see all these writers all these old school writers now that they 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 heralded as king and legendary um but but being that the bronx was big and all these other boroughs are huge what was you what what, how did you break that down in your head of like right i want to be king of this i want to king of that i want to go all city on this how did you break that down at an early age i would say i had ocd (laughs) like it stood (laughs) it it stood in my mind when i when i would go to sleep you know what i did was and not only that it was also my peers you know because um my thing is i was very blessed what I mean by that was that at a, a young age, like at the age of 15, 14, 15, I met Cope, you know, and mm. he he came with, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of um, tools because he was already king of the four line, you know, which yeah. is which is um, where Kings Ridge was. I was on the four line, the four train. He was king of that. He was very well admired. And he also came from the old days from the eighties, from the train days. Mm. So that elevated into like, okay, you got down with him. You know, you had to be motivated to step up your game. And what happened was that when I started bombing, I had a subway map, right? right? So I would check off each spot that I did, what rooftops I had between stops of the train. And then I will branch out slowly to other places, you know? And at that time it was very risky too, because like you're all the way in Brooklyn, you had guys out there like Kes Five, like Scuff. You had YKK crew. You had those uh-huh. Bushwick. You had that the Bushwick team over there, uh-huh. and if they ran into you, it was a problem. It was just like okay, you're all the way out in Brooklyn, bombing late at night, two, three in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they caught you, you was getting vamped. You was getting beat up. You was getting ramped. and that was around in every boroughs. You could say that you had different you know, different towns of that borough. And you had to be very careful. You had to be very careful. And at that time, at a young age, I'm mm-hmm. talking like 16 into 17, you know, we, we didn't have, I didn't, we didn't have cars. So we would have to take the trains out there, get out of the trains and walk, walk underneath the lines. Wow. And, you know, and, and all it took was for one person to see you, mm-hmm. report it to the crew, run back to the block. And then before you know it, you're going to have a dilemma going on. And that's, that's just a, the graph crew. That's just the and, graph and that's and, and that life. and that's just the graph crew. That's not including that. You know, you had uh, the Vandal Squad, which was a you know graffiti task unit out there, but yeah. that was just how it was back in them days. You know, but again, so when I started, after a while, you know, I was very blessed to meet guys like T Kid. You know, yeah. meet guys like Flight TDS. You mm-hmm. know, meet guys like Scene. So. Yeah. At that age, you know, I did so much bombing that after a while, I I got forced to be into peace and I got forced to try to, you know, create style. 
and and, the and, levels of what you're, and, you were turning and, around. And the levels that I was turning around. And remember, this happened so young for me. I was maybe 17, going into 18, learning how to piece. And I was already painting with legendary guys. So it was it happened so fast for me, so really, really fast. It's interesting you say that because, you know, again, just referring to the, the information that was passed on from overseas with GTV. I was trying to work out at the time. I was like, <laughs> you know, like, he, how old is this guy? Because yo, I was he, very young. Like when you saw yeah. that, when you saw that footage, I was maybe I had just maybe hit 18, 19, maybe. And again, and listen, and like now, like a lot of the guys in the bombing aspect, not in the piecing, but in the bombing yeah. aspect, a lot yeah. of the guys that get up now. Or usually on their mid twenties yeah. or in their early thirties. Man, I was doing all of that before I hit the age of twenty one. You know, as as a kid, I was already establishing all those methods. And then, so you we know, were pretty much the same age. Uh, when I watched you, we must be the very very similar age to each other. I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to be forty three in two weeks. I'm going to be forty three in August. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there you go. So there you go. There you go. It's actually, it's actually mad. Sometimes when uh, you, you, sometimes when you see somebody pull off a style, because like you're saying, up until I seen you, you'd you'd been doing like graft, you'd been doing hard work with some of these pioneers that are taking you under the wing. When I first saw you, bro, I swear, like it was almost like your your throw ups, your dubs were already built. It was almost like, yo, I don't know how, I couldn't guess how old you were because I was like, yo, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, I was like, yeah, around that time I was like 18, I think. Yeah, I, w- I was 18. I just came out of high school when I did wow. the footage for, yeah, I was already 18. You know, and again, and that goes, and and that was, you know, part of, you know, developing yourself, developing your style, developing your character, you're developing your characteristics as a mm-hmm. bomber because you have two, you have two different stages of it. You have the guys who like to peace and then you mm-hmm. got the bombers. So for me to develop being a bomber, a piecer, a tagger, it, it, an all-in-one, it, it was, man, it, it really motivated me, you know? Yeah, I think people, um, I mean, listen, I'm not, I'm no graffiti right? I am, I'm a conduit and a, and a massive fan. And, you know, after my 100-plus graffiti podcasts, I, I, would, I would say definitively that from, from what people say, you got to perfect the tag to perfect the dub. You got to perfect the dub and the drops to perfect the the. And Absolutely. It, it runs like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like like it starts from tags, then you get some drops which are bubble letters, right? <laughs> then from bubble letters it goes to straight letters. You know. So one thing as Obama when I grew up and even the generation from my time was you had to have at least a decent tag and a decent thrower. Mm. Then from there you take it to straight letters. Then from there, um, you go to simple styles, which is simple letters, you know, and that's what, uh, you know, my mentor Cope at the time, you know, um, developed into me because he would give me little sketches, little handouts, and I would practice mm-hmm. them. And mm-hmm. then from there, what I did was when, once I got into the simple pieces and then the semi wild style, I was looking at guys like Scene, guys like uh, Duster, you know. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, guys, you know, guys like Flight TDS, you know, mm-hmm. guys, you know, I was looking at multiple stuff because we didn't have a lot, but we had magazines, you know, a lot of magazines from Europe. We had, um, what was that called? Um, the Source Magazine, a hip-hop magazine. So we had a few yeah. tools. So like anyone else, I developed my stuff from copying other writers. And so I made it into mine. So I took a little bit of every writer and played with it until I was able to, you know, perform it to where it was to my like and, and it's and to my taste. And that's how yeah. I learned. Um, did that include the letters? Like at that time when you you were in, enrolled and under the wing of, you know, like you say, the likes of Cope, um, was was your was Ovi as a name established? What how what elements of that as a name did you did um did you adapt from other writers like? What does, where did Ovi oh, come from? okay. Well, <laughs> well, Ovi came before I met Cope. That was like when, I guess I was in my first stage of graffiti learning it. Yeah. You know, I had this one tag named Croc 2. And then um, people would call me Croc of shit. So I I, I got tired. I got tired <laughs> of that. I got tired oh, of that. So that was maybe like 12, 13 years old. So Good the idea, name, I think. So, yeah. So the name Ovi, um, 
basically what happened was, um, you know, one night my mother, you know, God rest her soul. She used to watch the late night movies on, on NBC. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. so one day, um, you know, I'm what I'm watching a movie and then it says, okay, late night movie. So I see the word movie and I like, and I like the letters to it. I'm like, damn, but the problem is it has five letters. Usually at that time, you wanted to get a name that had either three, no more than yeah. four letters, That's you know, right. yeah. you know, because, you know, when you had more than four letters, it takes more time. And remember, when you're bombing out there, you want to get in and out. So the more letters you got, totally. the more the more the more time is going to. I think you know, that all gonna, the time with some writers, man, I'm like, how the come you put yeah. letters? You're I crazy. Mean, I mean, I mean, but, you know, I mean, but you got writers now that have five letters, you know, like I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think all around five was the max. But, yeah. you know, you didn't really want to have five. You wanted to have less than five. So when I saw the word movie, I just took the M off and that's how I came with Ovi. That's sick. That that's how such I, a that's different how, way that, of thinking. That, that's how I came up with, with, with Ovi. That's the shit. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's how, how that came how about. Because how, how restrictive is the, the letter O? O is quite a... It plays in two factors for me. I mean, it plays simple at times because it's, you know, an O is the most simplest letter. So, mm. it, you know, it's it's a good thing in, in my end. And also... And oh, you can play around with it and mix it up, you know. I mean, you, it, it's it's always going to be a oh. People always going to say oh, but you could, you know, you can mix it up and not be frustrated when you're mixing it up. Like with other letters, yeah. it gets a little frustrating. But with a oh, you will never be frustrated, even when you're yeah, mixing it up. Enough. Right? Yeah. Correct. I, I love your I love your ease. There was always something about your ease, <laughs> they, like aggressive looking fuckers. <laughs> I know, like this one right here, right? Like this yeah, one right here. What? Yeah, like like E's, man. E, E's are my favorite letters to me. E and the letter E is like a standpoint. I mean, mm -hmm. it's I, I can't explain it like, but E's have, have always been my favorite letter. I'm I'm very blessed to have the E at the end of my name. Because yeah. the E, the E, you know, things might not be going well over here, but when you get to that E, it just like how you say that? It's like uh the nail in the coffin, man. It just That's cleans right. it up. It just cleans it up. It scans right. I know it what you're saying. It scans right, 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 yeah. right. It scans right. Like the E, you know, will make or break your piece. That's why how, how I always felt. I'm telling you now, what I love about Ovi as a name is uh, no one else. It's, it's very personal. Like no one else is going to copy that. <laughs> it's just like Correct. no one's ever going to have the same name like Ovi. Correct. But no, that's not true. Um, I think a couple of years ago, somebody, huh? di somebody DM'd me. That somebody was writing Ovi. I don't know what part of Europe, but it was somewhere Man. around there. And it was a and it was a female. It was matter of fact, it was crazy because it was a female. And then um, a lot of my friends were going in on the page, and then never heard never heard of the tag again. Yo, you never. have you got to <laughs> respect the fucking legacy holders. You can't. I, you know, yeah. That's, well, that's yeah. a, you know, that's 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 cool that the people like jumped in on that as well. They clocked it. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um. Uh, so how did you get, how did you get enrolled in the KD with, with Cope? How did that, how did that come about? Well, what happened was when, um, I, I started bombing the four line, you know, the line that I'm originally from. And there was a guy named Saze, S-A-Z-E, Saze R-K. He was down with Cope. And, um, he was from Kingsbridge too. He was also down with TNG. He was one of the first people I met that was right. down with TNG. And then, um, it was me, my boy Nex, uh, 3B, and my boy 2, rest in peace. It was us four. We was, you know, we was little kids, but we was a little crew together. So yeah. we started branching out around the area, and we started getting up in Kingsbridge. Hmm. So between all four of us, mainly me, my boy Nex, and 3B at the time, I was branching out the most. Like, I was the one, I was the one that was taking more of the risk. I was the one that would leave my house you know, I would sneak out of my fire skate at three in the morning and go bombing. Just work crazy. So, yeah, so I started getting up a lot. And then um, from what I was told, uh, one day Says got a phone call from Cope and he was very curious to who I was because I was like really, really bombing. Mind you, I'm over here 13, 14 at the time, but I'm putting in a lot of work. 
risking, mm. you know, risking getting caught, yeah. you know, you know, hoping that my parents didn't wake up and check the room because if I came in and if they came in the room and I wasn't there, I was getting a, a, a beating by the belt. <laughs> I was getting beat up by, by the extension cord or, or, mm. or a leather belt. So, mm. so finally, um, he was anxious to meet me, you know, mind you, this guy at the time, I'm like 13, 14. He's already like 23, 24. He's a grown, you know, young man already. Yeah, yeah. So finally, um, he, uh, he had called me, left me a message. Cause at the time we didn't have cell phone. We had rotary phones yeah. and, um, we spoke and then I met him you know, in his playing grounds in Mashula Park, we in the train station. He was at the time, he was a security for a supermarket, something like that. So we oh, met, okay. we met, yeah, we met at the train station. We spoke, you know, um, I went to his house that day and that was it. That was pretty much it. And that's that. Then I became a part of a legacy at that time. Yeah. Did you ever think, I mean, I guess you didn't have time to think being so young. It must have just been a complete imposter syndrome. I mean, meets. I mean, Yo! I mean, from pe- <laughs> people from my time, from that era, man, I mean, a lot of people could talk bad about the man now. A lot of people could say a lot of hate, hateful things about him. You know what I mean? But at that mm. time, I will say, because I'm not a biased person, if, if, you know, I might not like you, but if you put in work, I I, I would acknowledge and respect it. Okay, For he sure. put in the work. But sure. a lot of people at that time, he was praised. Everybody wanted to meet him because he was the fucking king of the four line. He was yeah. just the king of the four line. So when I got down with him, it was just like, holy shit. Like, it felt like I met the president, you know, like he was, yeah. he was that glorified. Because he had the, he had the quote unquote, the celebrity kudos of like the rap crews and the rap people like knowing knowing that he was from the era. And yeah, I would imagine that was just like, yo, it's almost like an entry, an entry into the whole Yes, yes. So to be down with him at that, at that time and and at at such a young age, it was like, whoa, you know, and and I got a lot of hate over that, even with my close friends, my close peers. Didn't like that. Well, the, you the know? kickback from you to elevating like that. Yeah, they so yeah, <laughs> they felt like I forgot about them. You know when I met them. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know. The, yeah, I mean, you know, that's the, that's the toughest <laughs> thing about um about these things because your intentions actually were the, probably the complete opposite. But yeah, um, no, and my intentions was okay. I got down with the man. Yeah, I'm gonna shine with him, but eventually I'm gonna bring you guys with me. And no, it was just a different ball field. And what happened was that after that, um, my separations from my peers was that, you know, a lot of killings were going on in my neighborhood. So eventually a good friend of mine's on uh, mine, rest in peace. He got killed in my, and you know, in not too far from where I live, two blocks from the high school that was down for me, which was Watson high school. He uh-huh. got killed. So, my mother at that point, she went up and running and we moved out. We ended up moving to Florida. So I parted ways with all my peers and I was in Florida for maybe a year, year and a half. And when I came back to New York, I ended up staying in my father's house, my grandmother's house out in Brooklyn. So, so you how, know. So how old were you when you came back from my, well, when did, how old were you went to Miami and how old were you when you came back? Well, when I, no, when I went to Orlando, Florida, I was about 13 and a half, 14 then right. I came okay. back, then I came back around 15, 15. And I, I stood there about a year and a half because uh, things weren't plotting out very well with my mother. So she wanted, she uh, decided for me to leave and to go back to my father, who was currently living in New York at the time. I understand. So, yeah. so when I went back to my father in Brooklyn, it just took a, a, a couple of months to me picked off right where I left off. Really? So you just reconnected? What was it like meeting T-Kid? And what was it, you know, what, what were those scenarios like? How did that play out? Well, you know, at that time, at that specific time, you know, it was like mind-blowing because, you know, T-K was T-Kid. T-K was a guy who conquered his in the 80s. And a you good guy know? as well. He's been on the podcast. He's, you, you know, know for Don right now. I mean, we, we have our differences now. You know, we parted ways. Years ago, mm-hmm. you know, not going to get into that. But at the time when I met T-Kid, it was like, you know, mind blowing, like, holy shit, because here I am, a young man. I was maybe 17, 18, and I'm hanging out with a grown guy who's already a legend, you know, because of the accomplishment that he put in in the train days. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? So that was another plus for me. How much of it is attitude, Ovi? Like, do, do, you, do you go into graffiti with an attitude of, I'm going to make enemies because I'm just going to go in hard? Or I'm going to make enemies because, you know, you've got, to, you've got to toughen up and just be prepared. I've already come from a hard place. So what difference is it going to make? Well, you know? I mean, that used to be my attitude you know, up until maybe when I was like in my thirties, but now, like, let's say even in the last few years that I've done my thing, um, like this, this game is very egotistic. That that's for sure. That's for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's ego driven, you know, it's, it's a competition. Everybody's trying to do their thing. You know what I mean? And, um, but I go to it, me personally, I don't go in with that strategy no more. I go with it as something therapeutic. Like I do it for me. You know, I felt like I built enough status and, and enough elevation and enough of me paying dues that I don't have to do that no more. I mean, if I do something simple now, let's say off a highway or off a rooftop or off a, or off a, a popular spot, it goes viral. Like, holy shit. This nigga yeah. came at it again. So, yeah. but in my younger days, yeah, you went in when I when I started, you know, getting up, you went at it with like, yes, I'm that dude. I'm that person. I'm that, yeah. I'm the king. I'm going to go and terrorize. And if anybody wants beef, it's whatever. It's whatever. That's like, crazy. like I didn't no. care. <laughs> like, like I had a good team around me. And, you know, and, 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 and a lot of my old team, you know, from back in the days could tell you, like, I will protect them. I will, I will carry a gun and I will protect them if there was any problems. And, you know, people, people had a, you know, question themselves if they want that smoke with me, you know, with the fire, you know, yeah. I, 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 with the fire at that time, you know, I'm talking about my mid twenties yeah. to early thirties, you know, but so now would you carry it. Would you carry a piece into the yard? Would you, would you? No, 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 a, no, no. When I went, that? When I went bombing, you know, I made sure I was never high. I made sure I never drunk. I don't get high, period. But, you know, here and there, I'll smoke a little bit of weed. I will make sure I don't drink. I will always go sober, focused, you know, and, 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 and looking for ways of thinking of situations, happens, what to do. Now, when we will go to shows or parties, then, yes, I will bring that with me because, you know, you never know who you're going to run into, you know? And at the time... There wasn't social media outlets where people would say, well, oh, this person is here or we're going to go there. No, we would just show up. And if everything was calm, we was calm. If everything was peaceful, we was peaceful. If everything uh, brought drama or static, we would bring drama and static. And that's just how it was. That, you know, it was the whole territorial thing that we spoke about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That which which ranks you know? across all the all the genre. The yeah, whole... yeah. And when you think about it now, you're like, really for paint? You know, like you know, you get into it. Like, really, we bring in all this smoke, all this fire because of paint on the wall. You know, you, you. I mean, but at the time, you don't think that way because of you know your peers because of what they into. You know, and it's and it's that energy that when you with it, it follows you wherever you go. And I had mm-hmm. to learn that. Later on in life, as I'm trying to be much mature now as a person. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, isn't it? Because the things that you do, as you, I mean, and remember, man, we, we're talking in retrospect of you being like super young, getting into it. You know, mind you, and, 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 and mind you, I was a teenager and I was already hanging out with these grown men that were like 10 years older than me. Which would teach you everything. It wasn't just one dimensional here. <laughs> it was like from two, I mean, even, even my boy, even my boy DJ Hess, he was a DJ from Kingsbridge. He was a popular DJ from Kingsbridge. Right. Man, he would throw these little private club parties. And at the age of 15, 16, he would get me in and I'll be drinking away in the fucking in the club, you know? Man. Then nobody asked me for ID, nobody asked me for shit, but they knew I was young, but because he had that reputation. You know, it, mm. it, it 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 played a lot of weight towards my favor. The kudos, the kudos alone, and like <laughs> you know, you, you, like you're um, you you kind of you should really do all these things when you're young. You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah, what better time to be learning and experiencing shit? Absolutely, abs- absolutely, man. And and everything happens. So 
everything happened to me so fast at a young age. It's just at insane. a young age. Yeah, it is. It is. But one thing I will say, you know, graffiti saved my life. It ruined my life, but it saved my life more than ruined it because it, at least it kept me straight. It kept me from striving. It kept me to be motivated. It kept me to push forward to what I wanted to do, whether it was bad or good. At least it didn't carry me into turning around and dealing drugs or being mm -hmm. a, a, an excessive criminal, scheming and scamming. And God forbid I wouldn't be here today, you yeah. know? So I look at it in that way. Did it ruin my life? It ru yeah, it ruined my life to get me a good job because, you know, I ended up doing time for it. I had a, I got a felony record, you know, back in 2007, 2008. They did an investigation. I was hitting a lot of clean trains. And then uh, it was me, Utah, um, Ita M-U-L, and my mm -hmm. boy Serge. So we was getting round up. And, you know, my boy Serge, he, you know, he, he, he they didn't have enough evidence at the time. But my other people, you know, at the time that I was rolling with, we ended up getting jail time. Did, you know, they, go so, back, did they go into the back catalogue? How far back did they go when, they, when this investigation took place? Well, my catalogue goes back from 1994, 95. But yeah. remember that um, statute of limitations was seven years. So they were piling up at the time what they had within the last two to three years. From the first, okay, so and, from mid noughties basically. Yeah, at the time we didn't know that the Vandal Squad they were up on the technology, but they were up, you know, on the what was it on the graffiti websites, and they were getting e um IP addresses from people posting, and then they would get subpoenas to go into your emails. And we didn't know at the time that they were doing that. And they were getting people through their emails, conversation, photos of trains being, you know, being being painted on. And mm. that's how they were able to build a case on me. Wow. And that was in 2007. Yeah. Mm. And then, yeah. Then I went in, what was it? In 08. I had to go in and do a year, a year and change. You know, Jeez. so. Wow. Yeah, and got out, got out on I got out on parole after a year. I did a program called Shock. It's like a military boot camp program. So I was able to complete that and, wow. and save 17 months of doing jail time because by doing that thing by, you by doing yeah, yep, yeah, six months of discipline. So when once I completed that, you know, I got out on early parole release. That mm. was it. That's mad. That's mad. Yeah. Uh, um You've got to think to yourself, because because when just going back to what you were saying about the uh, the good points and the bad points of graffiti, one thing that um, I take away from it personally, from a inspiring point of view, as an onlooker, is work rate. And I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of people suffer from industrious work rate. They don't want to put in the work. But one thing a, a graffiti artist, whether it's from the a full piece on a wall to getting out, the work rate is, is undeniably in, inspiring. I would say, of course. Of course. I mean, it's like in any other craft that you get into in life, you know, when you put your all to it, you know, there's no reason why you can't have a, uh, you know, success results. Yeah. You know, the more time you put in, it's like in anything, even as an engineer or a mechanic, the more you learn, the more you put time, the more you apply, the more you practice it, you know, the better you yeah. should be at, at whatever craft that you do, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, and in this game, man, you have to be open, willing and honest and, and say to yourself, what is it that you want? Because this just doesn't come with a peaceful territory. You know, this comes with problems. It comes with headaches. And if you're not dealing with that with people, then you have, then you're dealing with it with law enforcement. So, you know, you, you, yeah, you have to be ready. You know, if this, if this is what you want to strive in, if this is what you want to do, you know, as an, as an, I mean, I, I, yeah, as for me, you know, because now yeah. you, you got street artists that they paint a nice picture on the wall and then, they want to credit themselves that they were, you know, street vandals and they were doing it, which is really, yeah. which is really whack when you do that. Mm. Yeah. What did you want to, what did you want as an end result? What was, what was your ultimate to achieve back in the, 
the mid nineties, late nineties. What you know, because as a young person that is uh, aspiring and being exceptionally driven, like what, what did you want? What was your end goal in your mind? Well, at the time, at that time, it was to be all city. What I mean yeah. by all city was that you wanted to bomb every borough. You wanted That's to right. bomb the Bronx. You wanted to bomb Manhattan. You wanted to be seen in Queens, Brooklyn. You know, Staten Island is a borough, but they don't they don't consider it because it's like you have to take a boat. But it's far out there. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. far out there. But you wanted to be be up and notarized in all the four boroughs, you know, and that was the way I was processed to do it, you know, and I did it twice. I did it twice in my, in my cool. career. I did, I did all city twice, but Man. now, now, now it's different. Now is, you know, people are going from state to state that that's the new thing. Now people want to do the 50 states of the United States. So, but at that time, that's what you wanted to do. And, and it was hard to do it because again, it plays into what I said earlier. You had to go over people, you know, you had, you had a, you know, you had a beef with other crews from other boroughs, you know what I mean? So that, that, that made it a challenge in itself, you know, now my goal with that is, you know, hopefully, um, I'll be going to Europe soon. I just did. I just filled out my passport, you know, Yo. and, 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 it, and it's time for me to travel. It's, it's about that time. Better late than never. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, um, what was, I'm, I'm presuming uh, uh, I'm presuming Brooklyn um, and uh, Queensbridge. These were like the more harder areas for you to go all city in because of the size. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. I mean, I did, I did, I did. Maybe I did the J line out mm-hmm. there. I, I did. Um, I did the J line in Brooklyn. I did the A line. I did the D line in Brooklyn. You know, but Brooklyn has so many lines, but I did at least four or five yeah. of them. I did the B line out in Brooklyn at the time. You know, yeah. I did Coney Island. So, you know, these were like four major lines, but Brooklyn has at least seven, eight lines. It's just too much. It's just too much, too oh, huge. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. You know, but I did like the main center cities of Brooklyn, you know, the main, the main little areas of Brooklyn that are known, like, I bombed Williamsburg, I bombed Bushwick, I bombed Knickerbocker, you know, in those mm-hmm. times. You know what I mean? So I got the main ones, but again, Brooklyn is huge, you know. It's it's it's, it's a big borough. It's it's you know, yeah. it's a lot, you know. How did you study those um those areas? Was it a or more more importantly, when you'd go to those places, would would this be like a you'd be there for a week or you'd be there for one night? What like how did you how did you run well, up? This is how we did it. Like me, me and my 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 peers at the time, like we were cut, <laughs> we were cut out of high school, right? We we were cut class, and we'll jump on a train, you know, during school hours. We'll jump on the train, we'll go to uh, whatever location we saw on the map, and we'll look at the line. We'll look at it, you know, when the train comes out elevated. We'll look at the rooftops. We'll look at the street. And we'll determine, okay, let's go here. Let's go there on the map. We will check off. Let's go here. We'll highlight it. Let's go here. Let's go here. And then um, that's how we did it. I mean, my first my first all-city run I did was in 95, 96. And I did it with Tech. Tech BS. He's from Queens. Mm-hmm. And I met up with him. And um, we met in the Bronx. And, you know, um, he had new of me and I had new of him. So when me and Tech hooked up, he was more experienced, like he knew Queens and he knew Brooklyn. So at right. the time, he had a he had a, a minivan and he had a station wagon. So he would pick me up either in the Astro van or in the station wagon, and then we would go. We would go. He would take me to spots, and then there was a top a couple of times we met up in Midtown Manhattan. We would jump on the train and we would like go out to Queens or go out to Brooklyn, and we would we would get off the train and we would walk and we would bomb from there. That's how it, to what you were saying about the the work rate and how hard it was. It wasn't yeah. like the age you were. It's like okay, yeah, we got a, we got an Astro van now, but you know, yeah, we're there, yeah. yeah when, when, when we had when when I was able to get in a car with someone, oh my god, it was just like a bonus. It was like, it's like a, a game changer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, like a game. It's like a. It's like yeah, exactly. It was a game changer all the way. <laughs> so you know, because we were poor, we were from poverty. We didn't have these stuff back then. It was very hard. 
It was very hard, man, you know, growing up in poverty like that, you know, being being from what you say, the hood, you know, it, yeah. it, it wasn't sweet, man. I, there was times I didn't have um, train fare. I would have to hop the train to get on the train, you know, even with paint. Yeah. A lot of people don't know, like even with paint, you will have to steal your paint. You know, yeah, it, now, now, not, now, now people buy paint, you know, I which mean, which is crazy, which when you, you know? think about the ethos of what graffiti started. Off, and, that's and, another and, story. And, yeah, that's another story. And even with caps. With caps, now people, they sell caps by the bulks. Back yeah. then, you didn't sell caps. You had to go into, like, houseware cleaner shops to get oven spray caps just so that they could fit on the crawler and rust and you could get a good spray from them. It was the people wasn't selling caps. Caps were not being made for graffiti writers back in those days. It, it, it was a lot. And then you wanted to save your cap. And you know how you saved your cap? You Tell would, me how you cleaned it. How, how yeah, would you clean the cap? You would take a jaw and put turpentine liquid in it or anything with acid liquid, and you put your uh -huh. caps in there so that, you know, it can melt the paint that's inside the stem of the cap, and, and then you blow it out a few times, you know, but you leave it in Crazy. there for, and you, you leave it in there for a couple of days. Yeah, that's how it was. I'm telling you, that's how it was. That's how it was, and if you used it, you know, you can get a use out of it, but eventually, you know, it's going to get so clogged with so much paint that you had to throw it out, but you would get a good few use of it, but that's how it was. That's how it yeah, was. Tricks, it's not, it's not like, about yeah. the arts, man. That's part yeah. of the arts. Man. Yeah. It's not like now you go to a website. Okay. Uh, graffiti fat cap spray, spray cans, you know, and then you got all different, different label caps that you can buy and get shipped over here within a day or two. No, it wasn't like that back in them days. You See, know, these things are, the, the, Ovi, man, these things are Intel. And I often, <laughs> I often am like taken back by the, 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 the art within the art. And, and, and I, I miss, and I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm sorry no, to cut no. you off. And, 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 and let me uh, say something that I missed out on. Do it. That was another thing. Um, sometimes you had to make your own fat cap. You will have to take a blade and shave the tip of it so that it can spread out longer. You know, Ooh. a lot of people don't know that. Yes. I, I noticed actually on GTV your fills the way you were filling in right there that was not a normal cap going on there. No man, that, that if I remember that was a, a orange tip or, or or softball. Yeah, those were those were oven those were oven cleaner caps that I would have to take. They were that was dusty as fuck. Yeah, you yeah. Just, they they were oven cleaner caps. That was that was a company called Kitchen Magic. They were they was an oven cleaner called Kitchen Magic, and we would take the nozzles from that. We take we wow. would take them because <laughs> we we couldn't buy caps. It was very it, it was very rare that some somebody was selling caps. That was that was un, unheard of in those days. In, in yeah, for sure. And in those days, the like you say, the code of conduct was very different to now. And um, I don't know without without judging either side, old or present, to be into graffiti. Back then, particularly as a New Yorkian, um, you couldn't go. You couldn't go in there with a street art mentality. You literally had to learn those kind of rules and techniques. You had to be initiated in very much the underworld of the day, right? You couldn't just be right. like the pleasantry guy that wants to do a bit of art on the side. You, no, you're in, no, you're not. It was. It, it wasn't. It wasn't that you, no, you couldn't play both sides of that fence. No, you couldn't. No, it was either one or the other. I mean, you, you had guys that did pieces, but that's all they were known for. They wasn't known to bomb. Like you, at that time you had UW and UW, you had King B, you had Jew, um, you had, uh, what was his name? Nev, you know, you, you had, you, uh, let me see who else you had hoes. You know, you had a variety of people of that crew, but all they did was productions and pieces. Yeah. And then, and then, then around that time, you had FX. You know, you had mm. Per, you had Sus, you know, mm -hmm. and you had Yes Too, you know, yeah. Poem, you know, but yeah, but a few of them, you know, were from the street era. So, you know, but once you got into that aspect of graffiti, it was like. You really didn't play both sides. You know, mm. me, I ended up playing both sides later on because I was already established. And again, I didn't mind the piecing. I loved the artistic because it was a challenge for me. And I loved, you know, to rise to the occasion of a challenge. 
Yeah. But man, it, it, to me, I was embedded with the bombing. It's like, it's nothing like bombing. Yeah. It's just it's like, a, it's a different it's, feeling, it's I guess. Different feeling because, you know, and when you're painting a wall, your piece and you're there, you know, permission wall, you're there three hours. It's like, ah, uh, I want to finish already. But when you're bombing, it's like, you know, it's that rush, man. I want to do this shit and get the fuck up out of here, yeah. you know? And that's just how it is. That's no? crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in a different discipline, isn't it? You know, getting into the, the production thing. Absolutely. I mean, because, people, yeah, people, yeah, absolutely. Because when you're, when you're getting into the production, you want to come with your A game because a lot of people are going to look at that and a lot of people are going to criticize and judge. So you want to come correct. So mm. you have to deal with that as a piece, you know? Yeah. What's the, I mean, when you see at the moment, actually, to be fair, I'm seeing with from a, from a UK European standpoint, we're seeing a lot of full top to bottom productions going on in New York trains at the moment. That's just, crazy. that is like, crazy. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, you know, how, how's it happening? I mean, you know how they doing it, but I don't understand like the time, how an elevation that they have to execute because yeah. when I was doing it, you know, I always had this thing, you know, to be in there less than 40 minutes, you know, half yeah. an hour, 40 minutes, get out. Because right. the minute they report that somebody is in a subway yard, man, the cops will come and, and raid like the whole place. So how they doing it, I don't know. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you see that it's getting done, but listen, much, much props and respect to them. Yeah. You yeah, know, talk to, the, talk to me about the raid situation. I mean, you must have some <laughs> biblical old school stories. <laughs> of how Give me some of your the most wild. None that will implicate you in any which way. I'm sure you're past. No, that, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm past that. Uh, okay, yeah. Give me some crazy stories, man. You know, the people want to hear some crazy stories. This is the okay. pressure moment, right? <laughs> this is like, I think something. <laughs> okay, I got a good one. I got a good one. This was back in. I mean, it's been said. I might have said this maybe once or twice. Not. It's been said, but not a lot of people have really um, heard of it. Okay. Um, so we passed the time. So this is 2007. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's me, you, and right. And, um, right. we go into a uh, Bedford park, uh, train yard. You know, uh, we, we, we go in, we go inside the yard and, um, you know, me and we were the type that anytime that we went to go hit a yard, whether I was with him or he was without me, or if I went by myself or with one other person, we always had a habit of looking in between the lanes and looking at mostly every car to make sure, you know, there's no workers in there. There's no cops yeah. in there, you know, before we start to pull out the can and paint. So this specific night, we, we go inside the yard and we go all the way to the front of the train, the, the front lane. So, as we're there, me, you, and Cole, right? We're deciding what we're going to hit. So Cole says that he wants to hit the Redbird. You know, the Redbirds was an old New York City train. They were red. So they that they don't yeah, run. Them, they, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't. At that time, they already had stopped running them on service. But there was one in the yard. You know, and those are very monumental when you do them because, you know, they're no longer running. But those cars you know, they relate to the old school trains that were bombed. So, you know, you know, kind of. Pitch, yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. So he wanted to hit that. Right. Me and Utah, we decide to hit the bulldog, the silver train. And as we're splitting up, a worker comes down out of a train out of nowhere. I don't know where he comes down and he's looking at us. We're looking at him and like we're like both in shock. The workers in shock. We're in shock and we're looking at each other, right? Oh my god! Hey. So, so is looking like, damn, what do we do? And one thing uh. I can say, he always knew how to control a situation. I gave him that, but he turns around and tells the worker, "Listen, man, um, yo, we just want to paint our name on the train. That's it." So then he goes, "Yo, I'll give you some money." And then he says, "Oh, yeah, I got some money." Then I took out some money. So we ended up giving him, I think it was fifty-five dollars. $55 or $60. Yeah. 
And then we gave it to him. He goes, yo, here, man. You're, and then tells him, oh, we'll be out of here within an hour or less, not even four, a half hour. So then the worker turns around and looks at him. He goes, all right, hurry up. But whatever you do, don't hit the four trains. Hit the other ones. And now, and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, couldn't write that in a room. Yeah, yo, I swear to my mother, God rest her soul. And um, the <sighs> oh crazy, the crazy God. shit was that um, after he left, me and he leaves, leaves to go paint the red, the the red bird. Me and we start painting, and in the back of my mind, I'm saying to myself, "Damn, is he gonna? Is the worker gonna snitch us out? He's gonna say nothing." But then after five minutes, I felt comfortable. I felt like, okay, like, okay, we're good. That's it. We got, we, 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 we got, right. We, we got half an hour to commit what we need to do and leave. So it was like the pressure was gone after the first few minutes when I started painting. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. That's insane, bro. Um, yeah. Who did he? Back then, do the things run? Do things run? Because they were really diligent in the... In no, the no, no. You you basically did it for the picture because the minute yeah. the workers or the conductor saw it, it they, they had to buff it immediately. Yeah. Immediately. And and I got one one more story. I got one more. Wait, let, let me give you another story. So, <laughs> yeah, go on. so this one, this one I said before, this one actually even came out in an interview, but I'll repeat it again. Do it. It, it was be, it was me and my boy Gia four, right? So we uh -huh. go in the ghost yard. That's a very popular yard in, in uptown. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uptown in Manhattan. And that was where I did a lot of my clean trains in the ghost yard. Right. So me and my boy Gia, we go up in there, right? And um, we decided to paint. But what's different from this night, from most of the night that I went out to paint trains, I wanted to do a burn on a train. I said, you know what? I think I could do a burn. I mean, something like this with three Ds. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go for it. So to make a long story short, I took these red colors that nobody had at the time. It was a icy avocado green and a Krylon avocado which I regret to this day that I used it. I should have kept them, you know, but whatever. So I decided to come with the avocado greens and I said, you know what? I'm going to do something really, really fucking nice. So 20 minutes into it, right? Uh, I'm looking down the lane and we see a worker and he's all the way far away. So okay. I'm, 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 I'm going, yo, Gia, look at that, Gia. What do you think? He goes, hold on, stop. So we stop. So we see the worker from far away. He's coming closer and closer and closer to us. So at one point I said, yo, pack the paint. Let's go. Let's let's get out of here because, you know, so we went all the way to the end of the lane thinking maybe he might stop, make a U-turn. No, but he just kept coming and coming and coming. Finally, he looks at the train. So he saw us. All right. So then we run up out of this. So I'm saying to myself, yo. <laughs> Yo, my boy is like, yo, let's just go through the front because we felt like where we came in through, they were going to be workers over there. Gotcha. So when we go through the front, the security, he looks at us. He's like, hey, what's up? And then my reaction was like, hey, brother, what's up? Um, Yeah, we just leaving. He goes, oh, you guys were in unit three or something. He goes, yeah, yeah, we was there now. You know, they let us go. He, he was like, okay, brother, thank you so much. He opens the gate for us and what? lets her go. What the fuck? I swear to God. Yo, when he opened the gate, we fucking got up out of there. We jumped in our bike and we just got up out of there. Yo, sometimes you just got to be brazen. <laughs> the girly, like yes, sometimes, you know what it is? Sometimes you got to have luck with you. Sometimes luck is with you, actually. Excuse me. Sometimes luck is with you. So, yeah, man, those... Oh, just, you know, what's crazy? Just talking about it and going through the reliving the moment, man. I got like chills in my, 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 my arms already, you and, know, you know, this is the beautiful thing about podcasts. Cause not only is this translating to like a, 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 an, a new audience, international audience, but to relive those moments and. Oh man, you just took them back. Yeah. I'm like in another zone right now in my head. <laughs> that's what i like to hear that's what i like to hear. those days like i mean cause surely like because when you see the, the the paint being on the train like particularly in the news reports that I've, I've seen of recent times in new york yo like come on man like 
they got buffer resistant. They got they must have some cleaning protection over that thing. What are they doing running that stuff for? What are they encouraging it for? Well, Do you mean- what happens is when you see those trains running, right? Like you yeah. see it, like you just said in the news. Yeah. What's going on is this: is that um those trains they're not being done in the yards because if those trains are done in the yards, they're not leaving the yard. They're being mm-hmm. done in layups and tunnels because That's sometimes, right. okay. because what happens is sometimes the tunnel is so overwhelmingly packed with trains that they have no choice but to leave them into tunnels. And what happens is, is that all, most of these trains that you see on online, on Instagram especially, is that they're getting them in tunnels. And then um, once, once remember, when the train is in the tunnel, it's, gonna co- it's coming out to those tracks, are coming out to the public. Because it's not so, going back into the yard. Yeah, no, cool. right. Or, or it's going into the yard, but the yard is distance away. Yeah. So, you know, as a fellow, as a fellow train rider myself, what happens is sometimes they're going to, you know, you, you know where the train is going to run through. So you're either going to be in the station or somewhere in the facility that you're going to see the train running and you're going to get to record it. And mm-hmm. mind you, now with these phones that they got video cameras, when a passenger that's on the on the train station waiting for it for a train to come and they see that by the way they're going to stick out their camera and record it so you know and then eventually the news gets a hold of that and then they make a story out of it yeah you know so that's what's going on in terms of exploiting the 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 right there are from from a from a real basic level if you see your thing on a tv news report and they're demonizing it. That's immediate kudos and attention yes. on the very thing that they don't want. No, no, not so, at all. Not yeah. at all. So it goes against that. So I don't know, man. Uh, call me cynical, but I'm like, yo, so what are their intentions by promoting something that they don't want promoting? That doesn't make logical sense. I guess from, I guess from authority, law enforcement wise, I think, they, you know, it's probably to scare writers, to let them know that they're going to be up on it or to make mm-hmm. them think that. Because, again, these news, they report the shit. But then two weeks later or three weeks later or months going by, they mm-hmm. still doing it. Writers are still doing it. Yeah. So I think maybe as a way to like, you know. Let people know that there's a warning. It's already making the news. You don't want to get caught. Mm-hmm. But then some people just don't listen and they still do it. You know, I mean, I mean, that's the only tactic I could think of. You unless, know, unless there's a level of legislating a new law in. Maybe. Of, yeah, always, maybe. Uh, I know now from what, you know, li- um, listening to other writers that I've met up with, you know, from what I'm hearing now is that now they're putting hidden cameras, you know, um, you got to make sure that now you wear a mask because now they're going to have face recognition. So now they put in like hitting cameras, hitting sensors, you know, how true is that? I don't know. I haven't painted in trains in many years, so I wouldn't know, but that's what I'm hearing word on the street is. There's a lot of that, isn't there? No, a lot of That's what I was told. A lot of that going on, you know? And it's all speculative, isn't it? Like most of these exactly. things. Exactly. But podcasts. yeah, exactly. But it's being done because you see it. You see it on IG. You see it on Instagram every day. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, hey, look. And this is the this is the point I was coming to actually. We we diverted a little bit, but um Instagram is a help and a hindrance in many respects. <laughs> and I that you know, and everyone has a, their own opinions on on technology. It's unstoppable. It's never going to quit. It's only going to continue. We have to kind of learn that. But um same goes for street art and you know, or however you name it. Nowadays it's like street art is the order of the day. Beforehand it was it was um graffiti. Before that it was you know, just writing. It, it, it was crazy it was crazy because when I, you know, growing up into this, graffiti was a bad thing. The minute somebody said you was a graffiti writer, it was a bad thing. Yeah. Now it's getting glorified as a good thing. So I don't know which which side is it with, with people, you know, even 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 street artists. Back then, street artists didn't want to be recognized as a graffiti writer. But now yeah. they'll use the term that they enter the graffiti to get their leverage. 
the which is kudos, yeah, yeah yeah which is freaking fucking bogus yeah it's know? bogus without question i mean like pick a lane I, I agree with that immensely you know like don't because you're just like you're feeding off the the, the very art form exactly that, yeah yeah the very art form that people pay dues that people you know basically you know had a had a conquer through physical violence at times through you know, taking chances of getting killed by a subway train or yeah. getting killed by an arrival crew, you know, and now you yeah. want to market to your end. That's that's not cool. That's not no. cool. Ovi, you know? do you think there's no taming? There's no taming this this beast, is there really? But not at all. For, not at for all. New York, for New York, though, bro. You know, in a world of because New York. It's just like any other city in America. America as a whole, they don't celebrate much history and culture like the rest of the world. It's almost like if it's not making money, knock it down and rebuild, make something else. There's very few That's things. a fact. That's a fact. Yes. You know that, what I mean? that is, yes. But having said that, like one thing that holds true and, and often ends up being re-exported back to America, ironically, is your cultures. Um, and graffiti, it was New York. It's still it for me. It's like yo. It's like hip hop itself. It's 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 punk. It's um, it's uh, it's what was the beginning of modern art. It's jazz. It's like yo. You've got a, why? What would be the harm in having a celebrated moment in New York? Whether it be the trains, whether it be just bring That's it true. back to the home. Bring it back home. I said that myself. You know, but. Amazingly, you know, you got a lot of these. You know what's funny? That that point you said really stands out with me a lot. But it's amazing that you got these big corporations now that market it, that market us graffiti writers, and they make billions off us. Billions, yeah, yeah. Billions. Sure. Yeah. You know, but meanwhile, we can't get a day for it, you know, on a political aspect yeah. of it. Yeah. It's just, like I said, it's just bogus. It's just crazy. It actually you know? is. And we're not, I'm not saying here, go and do something crazy and legal and like stand up for yours. There ain't no protesting. I'm just thinking, yo, like. I mean, like to me, like mm. this is a nation that's full to the max of hypocrisy. Yes. So th- th- this is a world of hypocrisy that we live in. Well, here in the States of the United States, you know, especially New York. Hypocrisy yeah. is, is the word for it. Which doesn't actually bode well. When, Absolutely um, not. <laughs> When, you're trying, when people are trying to instill moral values, you're just like, what? <laughs> you, huh? Exactly. 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 I you. And I feel for all of my American friends, yourself included, yeah. Ovis, that it's, you know, for anyone with a sound mind and a logical thinking, it's, it's, it must be pretty, pretty hard right now. Absolutely. Well, brother, this is the first step to the international. Uh, uh, Thank you. Hi, road man, and I really appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, no okay. doubt. Where are you guys located in London, right? Just down the road from the from the um, national, the well, arguably world famous um, Trellick Tower Hall. Okay, of okay, yes. okay, uh, yes. The, so when you come through yes. here, come see me and go. Oh, down for to sure, Ooh, for sure. Get your piece for up sure. there. Enough yeah. part one's been down there. Tiki's been down. Like loads of people have done the Trellick. So, okay, yeah, that's, that's, I, no, I will. I would definitely hit you up for sure. That that's for sure. That's sure. no questions asked. No questions well, asked. Now we're, now we're connected now. So we're on the grid, baby. We got this. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell Thank you yeah. so much for joining me, Ovi. We'll chat afterwards, directly after this whole time. Let me just say what's up. No problem, um, bro. Go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please make some noise for the mighty Ovi wherever you are? Thank you so much for joining us today, my brother. No doubt. And thank you, man. It was an honor. I appreciate your time, the love, and the respect. Thank you so much. That's the vibe. That's the vibe. Killer Keller podcast. That was in like our fashion. Make sure you share. Sharing is caring in this day and age. All right. Keeping it true like that. All right. Stay lucky, people. See you on the other side. Peace. Peace.